Bibles today to Job 19. Job 19. So if you go to a, somewhere close to the middle of your Bible, you'll run into Psalms, take a left, and you'll be in Job. Okay? Job was the, the man who suffered. Uh, he went through a great suffering at the hands of the evil one, the devil. And uh, it's a very important book. It tells us how to have faith in the midst of suffering. And Job, indeed, went through suffering. He didn't understand it. He did not uh, understand having lived for God while he was going through such trials. And sometimes we may feel that way. But Job came out of it, and that's the good news, is we come out of it victorious if we belong to Jesus. We need to keep our faith. In Job 19, verse 25 through 27, if you will, in honor of God's Word, I'll be reading from a stand to your feet. I'll be reading from the New King James Version. Job 19, verse 25 through 27. For I know that my Redeemer lives, and He shall stand and at last on the earth. And after my skin is destroyed, this I know, that in my flesh I shall see God, whom I shall see for myself, and my eyes shall behold, and not another, how my heart yearns within me. The title of the message today is, Hello, God, are you there? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you today for your word. I thank you, Lord, for Job's testimony. I thank you, Lord, for the lives of these that hear me today. I pray that your word will penetrate the deepest rest recesses of our heart. Lord, help us to connect with you. Lord Jesus, we thank you that you are the shepherd of the flock. Teach us today. Holy Spirit, help us today. Give us eyes to see, ears to hear, and a heart to understand. As the word is broken today, feed us, Lord, that portion that we need. And may we respond in obedience to you. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. You may be seated. In the midst of the trial that Job was in, he had this confidence, I shall see God. At the time, it looked like God was a million miles away. He had no sense of His presence. The problems he was going through did not make sense. Job was at the end of himself. But he had this confidence, even though I don't understand what I'm going through. Although I don't know why I'm going through it. And though I don't sense God's presence. He said, I know this. That even after my flesh dies. And it, my skin is destroyed. I'm going to stand and in my flesh I'm going to see God. Job understood there is a resurrection coming. And we're going to see God. Hallelujah. I, that, that's both something that brings joy and fear. Amen. See God, awesome. See God, oh my goodness. Because we know that God knows everything about us. He knows the good things. He knows the not so good things. And yet he loves us. And he has demonstrated that to us. A lot of people today are, would like to have a vision and see God. Well, there's this kindergarten class, this teacher. She passed out some papers and she passed out some colors and some pencils. And she said, I want you all to draw a picture of something that really is special to you. And so she, after she passed out those papers, the kids began to draw. They, some of them drew their favorite pet. Some drew their parents, maybe the house they lived in, maybe the car, maybe the favorite toy, stuffed animal. It was a variety of things these kids were drawing. And the teacher, as she walked around and looked at these different drawings, she noticed this one boy, and she thought, I don't have any idea what he's drawing. She said, little Johnny, what are you drawing? He said, I'm drawing God. And she smiled and said, oh, Johnny, nobody knows what God looks like. And without breaking a little breath, he goes, oh, they will when I get through. <laughs> Job was confident he was going to see God. Amen? 
The Apostle John had that same hope in 1 John 3, 2. Beloved, now we are children of God. Isn't it nice to know we're children of God now? And it has not yet been revealed what we shall be, but we know that when He is revealed, we shall be like Him, for we shall see Him as He is. That day's coming, friends. That day's coming. We're going to be changed. We're going to be like Him because we're going to see Him as He is. Unfortunately, there are a lot of people, maybe even some here today, some under the sound of my voice, who don't have that hope. Maybe you've never accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. You can't say for sure that when you die, you're going to heaven. Some people think they're going to heaven maybe because, because of a hope and a prayer. I sure hope I am. I hope I'm good enough. Well, if you're basing it off of how good you are, then forget that. You're never going to make it. There's only one bridge to heaven. That's Jesus Christ. And unless you go through Him, you'll not make it. I thank, as a, thank the Lord as a nine-year-old boy, I called upon the name of the Lord that I might be saved. And I still think about that special day that Jesus Christ saved my soul. Amen? And then some others are thinking, well, I hope there's a God, but I don't know if there's a God. I don't know how to trust a God that I don't know for sure exists. So what do I do? And so they go through life without hope. I can't imagine living this life without hope. I can't imagine facing the problems of life without knowing there's someone to go to that knows my name, who cares, who paid a price for me, that I belong to Him and I'm in His hands. And He's going to walk me through it. It may not be easy, but He's going to walk me through it. He's going to get me to the other side. Amen? I don't know the future, but I know the one who does. And as long as I hold His hand. I'm going to be okay. And so are you. So are we. But a lot of people don't know if there is a God. And if there is, can we know Him? Even Albert Einstein, I'm told, one of the most brilliant men of history, he was convinced as he looked around at everything, he said, there's got to be an intelligent designer. But we could never know Him. We could never know Him. And a lot of people are that way. They just go through life wondering, well, I've never seen Him. And if He's real, why didn't He show us? Well, I have good news today. You can't see God with your natural eyes. The Bible says no one can see Him and live. But God has given us evidence. And I hope today that as we bring this evidence before you, just like in a court of law, you know, you can't go back and prove a murder existed by, uh, that took place by going back to the event. It's already happened. But what you do is you bring the evidence of what happened. And you talk to those who have testimonies. And you put it all together and on the basis of that evidence. You can say yes or no that murder took place. Or yes or no that person did it or didn't do it. Well today I'm not bringing you proof of God because... I can't bring you into heaven to show you face to face. But that day's coming. But right now we have evidence. And God has given us evidence. He's given us testimony. Amen. So the question is, is there a God? Is there a God? You say, well, Pastor Keith, we already believe there's a God. I know, but sometimes we may not be a declared atheist, but sometimes we are practical atheists. In other words, we live our lives as if there is no God because we don't really live conscious of His presence. You know, when you wake up in the morning, I hope that your prayer is, Hello, God. Hello, Jesus. I hope that when you wake up in the morning, you have that sense of His presence. That He took care of you through the night. And He's there meeting you in the morning. And you hear His voice saying, Hey, precious, we've got, something, we've got a good day ahead of us we got plans. God, I don't know what they are, but I know as long as I'm with you, it's all going to be good. Amen? And so I hope you experience that. But for some, you wake up in the morning, maybe you gave your life to Jesus 15 years ago, but ever since then, you really haven't had a conscious awareness of His presence. You come to church, you sing the songs, you go through the motions, but you don't have a relationship with Him because you're not convinced on the inside that He's really there. 
I know many times Christians go through that. They'll go through a tough time thinking, I just don't know where God is. It doesn't seem like my prayers make it past the ceiling. Well, folks, if God lives inside of you, if Jesus lives inside of you, all you got to do is breathe. He's already, he's already there ready to answer. He's right there living inside of us. Amen? But you've got to practice His presence. If He really lives in there, begin to acknowledge Him. Amen? Hallelujah. So let's look at some of the testimony, some of the evidence. First of all, creation testifies to the existence of God. Have you ever walked out on a beautiful day and looked around and go, my goodness, this is just so awesome. And then you have someone tell you, oh yeah, this has just all evolved out of nothing. And you think, how in the world could that happen? You think about the beautiful sunrise and the beautiful sunsets. And you think of the flowers and the bees and how it all works together. None of these things could exist unless there was some grand designer. Someone who made it all work. You know, even the eyeball with every, everything that has to be there at the same time for it to work. Even a cell is a very complicated thing. And all those pieces of that one little cell has to be there at the same time for there to be life. How do you evolve into getting all the right things there all at one time for there to be one cell and your body's made up of, I don't know, billions, trillions of them? And everything is different. There's DNA. Man, who designed the DNA? It's like the mapping system for everything that's alive. It makes you who you are. It gave you the characteristics of who you are. Who did all that just kind of happen when we look around? Genesis 1.1 tells us, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. God created. Now, He didn't come in and say, well, let me prove. He just said, I am. I am. I'm the one that created the heavens and the earth. Psalm 19.1, The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament show His handiwork. I don't know about you, but you go outside at night, out here in the country, of East Texas, you used to see those stars. You live in the city, sorry. A lot of you can't see the stars. But you get out on a dark night out in the country somewhere, and you see almost every little star up there shining. And you think, man, those stars are, according to what they say, trillions of miles away. Billions. How, how did all that happen? And we're on this little planet called Earth. And God, how did, how did all this come about? Who made all of this? And so even the heavens declare, I'm here. I'm out here. I made all of this. And I care about you. Romans chapter 1, verse 20 and 21 says, For since the creation of the world, His invisible attributes, those are His characteristics, are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even as eternal power and Godhead, so that though they are without excuse, because although they knew God, they did not glorify Him as God, nor were thankful, but became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. What he's saying here is, God has made the earth, His creation, like an, a classroom of object lessons. Even Jesus took advantage of that. Behold the birds of the air, the beasts of the field. Look at how the birds go out and they eat. My Father feeds them. Did they have to go out and look for it? Yes, but my father's making sure they're taken care of. In other words, he's saying, look at these things. These things are testifying to the reality of the Creator. This Creator who made all of these intricate things that we get to enjoy and look upon. And he said, these things testify to Him, His existence. But it says, those who, even though they knew God, they did not want to glorify Him as God. And they became futile in their imaginations. Folks, when you discount the existence of God, the Creator, you've got, to, you've got to do all kinds of gymnastics to try to prove He doesn't exist. It takes more faith to be an atheist than it does to be a believer in Jesus. To believe, be a believer in God. Amen? I watched a video one time of this uh, Richard Dawkins, the God delusion he wrote. Someone interviewed him and said, okay, what, what's the chances? How, how, 
how uh, uh, certain are you that all of this just happened? I think his statistic was around 85%. And they said, well, what about this 15% you're not sure of? Could God exist in that? Oh, no way. God could not exist there. Well, how in the world, what, what do you think happened? He said, well, maybe some alien beings. You've got you to gotta jump into some pretty crazy ideas. The question is, where did they come from? There is an uncaused cause of everything. Because every cause has a cause, but there has to be, as far back as you go, there has to be an uncaused cause for everything. And that's God. That's God. Amen? Hallelujah. Acts 14, 17. Nevertheless, Paul said, He did not leave Himself without a witness, in that He did good, gave us rain from heaven and fruitful seasons, filling our hearts with food and gladness. In other words, God has proven that He is here. He's left a witness of His goodness by giving us good things in life. C.S. Lewis, who was an atheist, who became a Christian after he began to think about all of these things, he said, I believe in Christianity as I believe that the sun has risen, not only because I see it, but because by it I see everything else. In other words, it's through the lens of Christianity that I see everything else. I see the sun, and through the sun's light, I see everything else. And through the lens of the Son of God, I see everything else. So, creation testifies. Also, conscience testifies to the existence of God. You see, conscience affirms the existence of a designer. Now, what is the conscience? I believe the conscience can be described this way as the voice of the human spirit. The voice of the human spirit. God made us spiritual beings. And it's the voice inside of us that testifies even when we don't want it to. You ever done something wrong and you wanted it to be right, but something inside of you said, that was wrong. And you're thinking, shut up. I don't want to hear that. And you keep trying to push that down, okay? That's your conscience. It is a moral compass that God put inside of every one of us. And what does a compass do? A compass, is a, it lines up with the truth of the magnetic field, and it can point you to true north. And from that, you can discern every other direction. God's put a moral compass in every one of us as human beings. Yes, we're fallen. But there's still a remnant of that moral compass within every one of us. Even if you're not a Christian, even if you live off in a foreign country, never heard the gospel at all, even if you were just some kind of pagan out there, there is something inside that knows there's a distinction between right and wrong, good and evil. Romans chapter 1, verse 19, Because what may be known of God is manifest in them. See, that's the conscience. For God has shown it to them. Folks, today, our conscience bears witness that there is a God. Our conscience bears witness that there is a God. You say, well, I don't know that there is a God, but you know that there is good and evil. You know that there is right and wrong. And you know that there is just and unjust. And so what happens is that conscience affirms those principles. The question is, where do those principles come from? Even though we may disagree on something about what's right and wrong because our conscience is defiled. We can defile our conscience. But this, the fact that there is a right and wrong issue, a just and unjust, a good and evil issue. Romans chapter 2, verse 12 through 16 says, For as many as have sinned without the law, meaning that they didn't have the Bible, will also perish without the law. And as many as have sinned in the law, meaning they had the Bible, they had God's word, will be judged by the law. For not the hearers of the law are just in the sight of God, but the doers of the law will be justified. For when Gentiles who do not have the law by nature do the things in the law, these, although they have not having the law, are a law to themselves, who show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness, 
and between themselves their thoughts, accusing or else excusing them. In the day when God will judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ according to my gospel. What he's saying is this. One day we're all going to stand before God. And one of the things that are going to testify against us in court is the witness of our conscience. Well, God, I didn't know. Yes, your conscience told you so. Your conscience bore witness to right and wrong, good and evil. And you didn't want to acknowledge God. You did not want to acknowledge right and wrong. You wanted it your way. But your conscience that I put inside of you was telling you you were going the wrong direction. You violated your conscience. C.S. Lewis again, he said this, My argument against God was that the universe seems so cruel and unjust. And it does when you look around at the cruelty and evil in our world. But how did, had I got this idea of just and unjust? A man does not call a line crooked unless he has some idea of a straight line. So a person who says there's something evil on the basis of what? On the basis of something good. Something's wrong on the basis of what? Something's got to be right. Where did that come from? Well, it came from God, because what conscience does is tells us that there is a moral lawgiver. And if he is a moral lawgiver that writes these things in our hearts, then one day we're going to stand before him as judge. And it is that, I believe, that many people do not want God in their life. They do not want to acknowledge there is a moral law. They do not want to feel they are accountable to anyone. And they don't want to believe they will stand before the judge who will hold them accountable. So it's easier to believe if I'm going to do all these things I want to do that are wrong. I just don't believe in God. And by not believing in God, I can say there's no moral law. And there's no lawgiver. There's no judge. And I can do whatever I want to do in this life. The problem is, is if there is no right or wrong, and if we really believe that, we're going to live in a society of anarchy. And in, aren't we going that direction? Once we remove God and the Bible from our schools and our courtrooms and our homes, now right and wrong is whatever we decide it is. Gender is whatever we decide it is. Life is whatever we decide it is. But if we'll get God's moral law back out, And we'll begin to line up our lives with this. Folks, things will begin to come back into order. Amen. Some sanity will come back in our society. Amen. Not only that, but Scripture testifies to the existence of God. Isaiah 45, 21. Tell and bring forth your case. Yes, let them take counsel together. Who has declared this from ancient time? Who has told it from that time? Have not I the Lord, and there is no God besides me, a just God and a Savior. There is none besides me. You see, there came a point, even though God revealed himself in creation, even though God reveals himself through conscience, those things can be defiled. People can begin to worship creation instead of the Creator. And so, therefore, God has given us his written word to clearly point out what he meant when he created And what is right and wrong, even though our conscience may fight against it. So his law is a standard. He wrote it down. And he gave us a historical account of redemption history. From the beginning, how God began everything. How man fell. What God has done to bring us back to himself. All the way through Jesus. And even now, we see his providential work throughout history. God is working in our lives and in this world to bring this world to himself amen so scripture testifies through this divine record of scripture it testifies that he is god he exists history is his story his story of redemption also jesus testified to the existence of god jesus see jesus came as god with skin on You couldn't see God. Nobody can see God the Father and live. 
But Jesus came in, his, in incarnate, mean in flesh. He came to this world and he, he said, this is what the Father is like. When you've seen me, you've seen the Father. He wasn't saying, I am the Father. But he says, everything I do, it's because I, my Father does it. Everything I hear my Father say, I say it. Everything I see my Father do, I do it. He said, I am an exact representation of what God is like. And so Jesus testified to the existence of God, John 1, 18. No one has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, that's Jesus, who is in the bosom of the Father, He has declared Him. He's revealed Him. John 6, 46, Not that anyone has seen the Father, except He who is from God. He has seen the Father. So Jesus Christ came and testified of the goodness of God. He testified about the reality of God, the nature of God, and the salvation of God to lead us to God. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. John 14, 6. No one comes to the Father but by me. Not only does Jesus testify to the existence of God, but the Holy Spirit testifies to the existence of God. He testifies of the person of Jesus Christ and he also testifies of the reality of sin, righteousness, and judgment. John 16, verse 13 through 15. Jesus said, however, when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. Amen. Aren't you glad the Holy Spirit is with us to guide us into the truth? I don't have to just trust in my own ability to figure out what the truth is. Amen. I, I have the spirit of truth that will lead and guide me. For he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak and he will tell you things to come. He will glorify me, meaning Jesus, for he will take of what is mine and declare that to you. All things that the Father has are mine. Therefore, I said he will take of mine and declare it to you. So we see this progression. The Father gives it to Christ and the Holy Spirit reveals it to us. That's the progression. The Holy Spirit does not come to glorify Himself. The Holy Spirit will always point to Jesus. And Jesus always points to the Father. That's the way it works. When Jesus was on earth, He didn't come to glorify Himself. He came to glorify the Father. And He said, when I go, I'll send the Holy Spirit. And He will take of mine and reveal it unto you. John 16, verse 7 through 11. Jesus said again, nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the Helper, which is the Holy Spirit, will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send Him to you. And when He has come, He will convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Of sin because they do not believe in Me. Of righteousness because I go to My Father and you see Me no more. Of judgment because the ruler of this world is judged. You see what the gift of the Holy Spirit does when He comes into the world? We're so messed up. We think right is wrong and wrong is right. We're all confused. But the good news is that even if you're in your mess of confusion, that the Holy Spirit will come, and if you're, even if your conscience is defiled, the Holy Spirit will come in a powerful way and begin to convict you of what you don't believe. He will convict you that Jesus is the Christ even though you say, I don't believe in Him. Something on the inside will say, He's real. Oh, no, He's not. God is, a, God is real. Oh, no, He's not. Oh, yes, He is. And you'll be wrestling in there. Because the Holy Spirit is a good wrestler. Amen. I've wrestled with Him many times. And you don't win. Amen. You can try to run, but you can't run from Him. Some of you may be wrestling with the message today. I can guarantee you, even when you leave and say, finally, I'm out of there, you'll still be wrestling when you leave. Because that word will not return void. But it will accomplish what He sent it to do. Amen? Hallelujah. Not only that does the Holy Spirit testify, but experience testifies to the existence of God. Experience. Now, experience is subjective, meaning that you can't count on it being truth. You know, someone says... Uh, you know, there was something flying around in the sky, and I think it was an alien. So, I mean, I believe in aliens because something was up in the sky, and so it must have been an alien. Well, that might be true. It may not be true. But if you live your life as if it's true and there's no proof, 
you know, you're going to be living in a fantasy world if all you do is live by experience. You know, it's like the song says, it can't be wrong when it feels so right. Oh, yes, it can. It can be very wrong when it feels so right. You get people in the mo moment of passion or desire or, or heartfelt cr criminal minds, they may feel like this is right. That belongs to me. I mean, after all, I mean, you know, I deserve it and they don't. And it may seem perfectly fine, but it's not. So experience is not a good uh, discerner of truth. But experience can confirm what's already true. Amen? And so, experience can only be trusted when it affirms and confirms objective truth. Whether it's the scripture, the word of God that I've, I've already pointed to, the words of Jesus, etc. But when we look around and we see radical transformations of lives... People who were one way, just going to hell in a handbasket. Think of Paul the Apostle. He was persecuting the church. He was dragging them off to prison. He witnessed the stoning and martyrdom of Stephen, one of the deacons that testified. I mean, and then yet on the road to Damascus, he has an experience with the, the Jesus that he was persecuting. And it transformed his life to the point it totally changed him from being a persecutor to being a preacher. And now he would give his life for Jesus. The same one he persecuted. How can you explain a transformation like that? How can you explain your transformation if you are a Christian today? When people look around and they see someone that used to be this way and now they're in love with Jesus, their life has changed, their marriage is salvaged, suddenly God has done a miracle in their life, maybe a healing has, take pl has taken place, signs, wonders, and experiences. These things cannot be taken on just you know, for themselves, but they testify that everything they claim is true. And so experience is also evidence. It's testimony. I hope my life and your life today is part of the evidence that people can look at and say, I believe in God because I see what God did in them. I believe that Jesus saves because I see what Jesus did in them. Amen? All right. 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 27. Then a man of God came to Eli and said to him, Thus says the Lord, Did I not clearly reveal myself to the house of your father when they were in Egypt and in Pharaoh's house? In other words, God saying, I showed myself through the evidence of miracles, signs, and wonders. I showed myself to them. He said they, they had the evidence of these miracles. They had the evidence of signs and wonders. I showed myself to them. So if God exists... And I gave you the evidence that he does. It, it's not a leap into the dark. Some people claim that Christians are just, that faith is just a leap into the dark. No, it's a leap into the evidence. It's like a jury going out with all the evidence and saying, based on this evidence, I believe this is the verdict. What is the verdict in your heart? And it takes faith to go from the evidence to the experience. You can know Jesus Christ today. You say, well, I don't have proof. You're never going to have proof until you meet Him face to face and it's too late. But Hebrews eleven six, 6, without faith, it is impossible to please God. You're going to have to take that leap of faith into the evidence. I, I prayed with a guy one time who said, well, you know, I want to believe, but I, I, I don't believe in God. And I said, well, would you be, let me ask you this question. If there is a God, and if one day you're going to stand before Him, and you're going to give account for your life, and it's too late then, wouldn't you want to know there is a God before you die than after you die? He said, well, yes. I said, would you be willing to pray a prayer to a God you don't believe in, and ask Him if He's real, that He will reveal Himself to you? I said, well, he was honest enough to say, well, I... I'll be glad to pray that prayer. So I led him in a prayer. And it went something like this. 
God, I don't believe in you. I don't believe you're ex that you exist. But if you do, I want to know. If you do, I don't want to die not knowing that. If you do, I'm asking you to reveal yourself to me. However, you need to do that. Amen. He prayed that prayer. And I said, now, sir, thank you for praying that prayer. And I'm praying that God will begin to reveal himself to you through things you're going through, things you hear, things that you know are not coincidence, so that you'll know there is a God who exists. I never, I mean, that was in a different church, a different place, never met the man again. But I'm trusting that, that God honored that prayer and revealed to him. So, the question is next, does God care? Does God care? If He exists, does God care about me? I'm, I'm one speck on the earth out of a multitude. 1 Peter 5, verse 6 and 7, Therefore humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that He may exalt you in due time, casting all your care upon Him, for He cares for you. Not only does God exist, but He cares about your life. He cares about what you're going through. Deuteronomy 31, 8, And the Lord, He is the one who goes before you. He will be with you. He will not leave you nor forsake you. Do not fear or be dismayed. Not only does He care, but He's with you everywhere you go. Even before you give your life to Him, He is there. He is actively working to bring you to Himself. So He does care. And we can know Him. God wants you to know Him. God is not trying to hide Himself so that you'll die and go to hell without ever knowing. He wants you to know Him. Jeremiah 31, verse 33 through 34, talks about this new covenant that we celebrated with the Lord's Supper earlier. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and write on their hearts. And I will be their God and they shall be my people. No more shall every man teach his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they will all know me, from the least of them to the greatest of them, says the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity and their sin I will remember no more. In other words, this new covenant is all about getting to know the God who created everything, the God who made you, the God who loves you, the God who cares. John 17, 3, Jesus said, And this is eternal life. We wonder what is eternal life? This is how it's described. That they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. Eternal life is not just about living forever. Eternal life is about having a relationship with the life himself. The life giver. The one who can give you and sustain you in eternal life. 1 John 5, 20. And we know that the Son of God has come and has given us an understanding that we may know him who is true. And we are in Him who is true. And His Son, Jesus Christ, this is, the one, this is the true God and eternal life. So God wants you to know Him. You can know Him today. So how can I know Him? You're in here today. What do I need to do to know Him? Let me just say right up front, the only way to know God, the Father, the unseen God, is through Jesus Christ, His Son. John 14, 6, I quoted it earlier. Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you want to come to God, you've got to come through His Son. Because His Son is the bridge. He died on the cross for you. Matthew 11, my last verse. Verse 25 through 30. At that time, Jesus answered and said, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and prudent and have revealed them to babes. Even so, Father, for it, so it seemed good in your sight. All things have been, been delivered to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, nor does anyone know the Father except the Son, and the one to whom the Son wills to reveal him. Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. 
for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Jesus is saying, everything the Father has, He's given it to me. No one knows the Father except the Son. And no one knows the Son except the Father. And the one to whom the Son wishes to reveal. Today, Jesus is here, revealing the Father to you. The God who created all things. The God who made you. The God who has a plan for your life. Who cares. Who wants you to know Him. He is here today. We're going to have an invitation and give you an opportunity to know this God. To know Him through His Son, Jesus Christ. To know that one day when you face Him, you'll not be facing Him as the judge who will condemn you to eternal separation, one that says, I never knew you, but to a God who knows you, who knows you by name, you have a relationship that doesn't start when you meet Him. It starts when you give your life to Him now. I'm going to ask you to take that leap of faith. If you don't know Jesus Christ, not a leap into the dark, but a leap into the evidence. A leap into a relationship that is better than you could ever imagine. A relationship with the one who can change your life and begin to write, turn the chapter and begin to write a new story. A new beginning can start right now. As we stand. As our elders and their wives come. I'll meet you down here too. Encourage you to go to them. And if you need prayer. If you need uh, to come to the altars. They're open too. You can just kneel and pray. I hope you'll do what God puts on your heart to do. It's all about Him. It's all about doing business with Him. I just pray. As I pray right now, Lord, the word has been spoken. The bread of life has been broken. And it has gone out to feed your people. I pray now, Lord, that your people will respond to the Spirit of God and to the evidence of your work in their heart today. And God, I know that you will do inside what I could never do. Do it, Lord, as people respond in Jesus' name. Will you come?